yes, I'm wearing the same thing. I'm recording a couple more videos tonight before I go to sleep. But I just made an hour long video of the walkthrough of e-tuning. And I kind of included some questions and answers to that regarding e-tuning. But I decided to split it into two separate videos. So I'm going to continue on doing that. Um, I went through some of the other stuff, but I actually have this frequently asked questions area. And I'm going to kind of go base off of this now to kind of better explain because um, I know a lot of people probably just don't like reading and they'd rather just listen so the first thing is knock knock who's there so on Subarus most of the time you'll have the dam or dynamic advanced multiplier or on older Subarus you'll have the IAM or IAM and you'll have find knock learn and feedback learn or no not feedback learn but feedback knock so find knock learn is primarily the learned knock that the ECU sees meaning and I kind of explain it here on this video or on this page if the car sees a certain knock such as feedback knock at a certain RPM and engine load, it will translate that or transfer it to feedback knock. So every time you go to that exact RPM and load, and if it always sees feedback knock, it's most likely going to create and make and translate that over to the fine knock learn. And it's gonna stay like that until the car does not see any more knock. So sometimes on some cars you will see um, positive fine knock learn. And that means that it's working back in the timing because it's not seeing it as much. So that might happen if you were low on fuel and it was bad fuel, you might get knock at a certain area. And then over time, you know, you might put in a new tank of gas or change the spark plugs or something like that, you might see positive fine knock learn and it will start adding the timing back in. So that way it doesn't knock anymore. Uh, DAM or IAM, dynamic advanced multiplier. Uh, on most modern Subarus, you'll have it at one. On the older, you'll have it at 16. So normally they go down, uh, I think it's, it, it really depends on how the tuner has it set up. Because some of them have it set up to, let's see, so this has it set up to where it automatically sets it up to one So these are all the damn values that it can go down to. So it could be plus one, it can be 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, da, da 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 I would say normally on a car, if it drops between this, it's not a super big deal. It just might be trying, it might just be bad fuel. And what it necessarily does is it applies to all the tables. So if you're running at 20 PSI and dam drops to 0.75, it's probably, theoretically, how it should work. It works as a multiplier. It's going to take out 25% from the boost table. It's going to technically add fuel, not as much as 25%. But it's going to add fuel, richen it up a little bit um, to stop whatever's going on with the car. It's just there as a safety feature. It makes, if it drops, 
sure you want to get the car checked out, make sure everything's running right, send logs to your tuner. Um, but I would normally say if you get this area every once in a while, I wouldn't really worry about it too much. If it drops below that, that means there's probably an issue which could range from spark plugs, fuel, oil, uh, AC compressors turning on, this is just the noise from it, certain things. I would definitely just send logs to your tuner. That way you're a little bit more safe and secure about that. Um, find knock learn and feedback knock can happen, especially on an FA20. It can happen with the AC compressor turning on. The cars are very sensitive to knock. So I kind of, I think Cobb also released something, but I, I put it here, what type of numbers that you can expect. Um, at idle, you shouldn't see any knock at idle at all. Unless you have TGV codes popping up, maybe for bad TGVs, something like that. Um, I think there's something in the tuning software that we personally cannot see, but on cars that have TGV codes, anytime you apply the throttle, it automatically pull, it, it'll show, it'll register a knock of negative 4.92. Um, anytime you push the throttle, if you have any TGV codes, it'll do that. Obviously it's false knock, but I think it's a safety feature that Subaru put into the car and that's just where it's at. Um, normal driving, you're probably, you probably should not see that much knock. On FA20, you're probably going to see knock every once in a while um, a negative 1.41 or negative 2.81 up to about negative 4 is not as bad if it happens every once in a while um, obviously negative 4 more if it's happening all the time then there's obviously an issue that needs to be fixed whether that's the tune or a mechanical issue on the car but I will say that if the car was tuned perfectly um, and there was no knock before during the tuning process or anything like that and it starts randomly knocking later on it's most likely something with the car maybe the plugs maybe the intake valves it could be a multiple of things and that's where you kind of have to send logs to your tuner in order to figure that situation out um, during watts, wide open throttle, if you see the occasional negative 1.41 or negative 2.81, I wouldn't be too concerned. Um, if it's anything higher than that, I would send a log to your tuner just to double check. Um, talking about high knock values on these cars, so there's kind of a crazy um, thing with those, especially with, I'm going to talk mainly about the FA20 because STIs and EJs, you don't see that much knock most of the time if they're tuned properly. But FA20s, like I said, are very sensitive. So you're probably going to get a lot of knock. Sometimes you will have a car that does the negative seven, negative nine, sometimes negative 11 knock um, normally during like a third gear pull you'll see a negative 11 at the top end of the rpm if boost is too high on pump gas or something like that like i said there always could be many reasons but that's the main reason i see it being too high um, boost just being way too high at the high rpm on pump gas so, <laughs> a little fun topic to talk about. Over the course of the past five years of tuning these cars, 
I will say 97% of the people that either a rod left the car, spun bearing, the engine blew up, I would say 97% of people that have had that happen, <laughs> they don't register no knock. So you can kind of take that as you want, <laughs> but it is very rare that I've seen a car do like a negative nine. Okay, that's that's... I've seen a couple of cars do like a negative nine and then they spin a bearing right after. But the cars that actually like blow, blow, blow up, like a rod ejects out, most of the time, they're not even pushing on it. It's just cruising. They're just getting on the highway, whatever the case is. I don't know what, most of the customers that I've seen have a rod exit. They're not even going what, okay? They are just, for some reason, normally driving and getting on the highway. <laughs> it's, it's always something about getting on the highway, the on-ramp. At low RPM, not even pushing it that much, not even 100% throttle, and a rod just, doop. They don't even get no um, knock registered. I've had a customer that was logging during one of them. And literally the log showed, just it just showed him increasing speed, mild boost, nothing crazy. There was no knock whatsoever. And that you know you just see the RPM just drop. Um, so you can take that as you want to, but most of the time the cars, the customer cars over the past five years that I've seen um, either spin a bearing or or a rod go out the block, their car doesn't show any signs of knocking whatsoever. So that's just one of those things that I've experienced over the past five years. And that's just that. Now, what causes knock on an FA20? It's a lot. I'll be the, I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person to tell you guys this. And you might think sometimes that the tuner is just, yo, this tuner is just giving me excuses. No, 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 no. First thing, bad gas. And I want to talk about that a little bit because some people like to fight about what's good gas and what's bad gas. Nobody can tell you if it's good gas or bad gas. That's just plain and simple. You never know or will know if you get bad gas or good gas. The bad gas most likely was has a lot of condensation and water in it. Or if you put 90 octane. Or if you go to a gas station with 0% ethanol. These cars hate that. They are going to knock and damn drop. So if your car was running perfectly fine and then you went on a little road trip and you went to a gas station and they had 0% ethanol, don't be crying to your tuner or blowing them up saying, hey, my car's knocking, the tune's the problem. No, it's most likely <laughs> that it does not like the 0% ethanol. Um, cracked or bad plugs. So on these cars, I've come to realize that after about five years of tuning these cars, a lot of people don't take care of their cars. They don't do any type of maintenance or anything like that. And then they try to blame a tune for the issues that they're having. No. I have tons of logs showing knock and dam drop. I tell the customer to change the plugs and voila, nothing changed in the tune, all the issues are, are gone. So when it comes to knock, I think a lot of people try to possibly go straight to the tuner, but most of the time, um, 
and, and I'm telling you guys real actual things because whenever anytime somebody ever messages me about knock issues or damn issues, I ask them three separate questions. Every single customer for the past five years. One, how many miles are on the car? Well, the engine. When was the last spark plug change? And third, when was the walnut blasting done on an FA20? You obviously don't need to do that on a STI or anything like that. I will say that mm, I'm trying to give you guys a more real, realistic number. I'm, I'm going to say 50-50. I'm going to say 50% of customers that I have over the past five years will tell me that their car has 60 to 100K miles on the engine. And either A, they've never done a walnut blast, or B, they've never done spark plugs, or C, they still never did a walnut blast or they did spark plugs at like 20k miles you need to understand that if you keep the car in completely stock form sure there is a um where is it at give me your ex maintenance sketch there is a maintenance schedule that you follow okay um let's see let's see let's see where is it i think it's 30 what was it 60 i think it was yeah so they say 60,000 miles for spark plugs but i think there was a better one there was i think it was this Maybe. I know. Come on, man. Where did it go? Maybe this one? Reddit? Oh, come on. Where, where is it at? I guess it just disappeared. Um, I remember looking at one, and it even mentioned the walnut blast. But I just can't. Uh, there was one that actually said a walnut blast on it. I just can't find it. But the one that we just saw, it showed spark plugs being done. Yeah, no spark plugs, no spark plugs, no spark plugs. Yeah, 60,000 miles. That is for a stock car at stock power. <laughs> I think a lot of people misunderstand that. So if you're adding more power than stock or you're putting ethanol in the tank or you're going stage one plus or stage two plus or stage two, this number is non-existent. Non-existent. If you beat on your car, non-existent, okay? If I normally suggest to customers, depending on how you drive your car, if you're using ethanol, your spark plugs should probably be changed every to uh, 20 to 30k miles unless one of them gets damaged from install error or something like that that is if you are driving the car hard or using ethanol or making more power than stock obviously the higher you go in power obviously for an fa20 your problem majority of customers are going to be in that like 
350 to 450 range. There's a very small percentage of people that are going higher than that. If you have a Subaru STI or an EJ engine, obviously you're probably going to you're probably going to change them much faster. As you make more power in a car, you're going to reduce that number drastically. Um, that's why you see people with race cars, like dedicated race cars, every week, every two weeks, after three track passes, after one track pass, they change the plugs. It's just their preference. It's making sure that everything is good. Even some of them change the oil after a track weekend. If you're going to make more power, you can't follow the original Subaru um, service manual. You just can't. So over the past five years, I've seen about 50% of my customers that say, hey, my, my car has 50 to 100K miles but I haven't changed the spark plugs yet. Or they buy a new car from somebody else and them personally haven't changed the spark plugs. If you buy a new Subaru and you don't have concrete proof <laughs> that the owner changed the plugs or changed the oil, do yourself a favor and just do it. Don't sit there and wait for the service manual to say it because you never know. A lot of people lie. And it just causes more issues. Um, walnut blasting. I think the other thing, I can't find it right now, but I could have swore it was like 60,000 miles. Walnut blasting, I would say around 30 to 40K miles, you should just get a walnut blast done. Most of the time, there's a lot of carbon buildup on the intake valves, and that will cause knock and dam drop. Um, I would recommend it at 30 to, yeah. If, as I said again, if your car is modified and you're making more power than stock, do it every 30 to 40K miles. Sometimes you can get away with it to 50K miles, but I see a lot of people get it done at like 80K, and there's so much caked up um, carbon on the intake valves. And most of the time when you get that done, all the problems go away. Now, uh, where did it go? Facts. Subaru Diagnostic. So let's talk about some of the Subaru Diagnostic stuff. Now, I know this can be a very irritating part of the tuning process but there's a lot of truth to it um a lot of e-tuning most of it is spent figuring out air leaks or install errors majority of it or possibly bad gas but most of the time it's air leaks and install errors because some customers just tend to install things wrong. Um, when it comes to a boost leak, you have to understand that a tuner is not there with the car. I can read a log and just tell you, hey, there is an air leak. And I don't know if I can find a log right now that shows that. Um, let me see. Ah, so like right here. Perfect. I, I got it on the first try. So, because it's common. It's very, very common. So, when a tuner sends you a base map, you tell him the intake that you're running. The intake, most of them have... and use the same math scaling. Now, I got smart, and years ago, I took every single intake, 
after I think like the first or I think the second year, I went into Excel and I took for say the SF intake. I put every single calibration for that year into an Excel. That's just an exaggeration. I probably put like 20, I think it was like 25 I used. I put all the calibrations into one Excel page for the SF intake and I got the average between all of them out of those 25 to 30. So it pretty much narrows down where that intake should be. So if you ask me for a base map for an SF intake, I'm going to paste it here. The the average out of 25 to 30 other cars of a FA20 calibration, the average of them all. So, you know, some cars are different. Some will take a little bit lower. Some will take a little bit higher. I took the average of all of them. Some of them are spot on, whatever the case. It gives me a very good rough point. And normally, if the car has no issues, the car start up perfectly. When you do your idle log and you know the math calibration and injectors are good, you will come to this and you'll see a total, well, you're not going to see this total correction because that's a separate math, um, math correct, uh, solution that I did, but you'll see AF correction, AF learning. If your AF learning or AF correction is not between five to 10% at idle, you can go as far as 7%, positive or negative. If it's up in the 20s or 30s or 40s, you most likely have an air leak. It's not the tune. You possibly installed the part wrong or didn't tight, tighten something down or a gasket is messed up. Um, because when you tell me the parts list, I'm gonna take a stock tune, I'm gonna gather your parts list, your intake, I'm gonna change the math scaling to what it should be and what's worked in other cars and it's gonna output a number. And I know what it's normally going to see. So if you tell me you have a Cobb SF intake or an ETS intake or a GS intake, if you tell me you have a GS intake, I'm gonna give you the GS calibration with the injector settings, the proper ones, that I know the base map works in every single car that has zero problems. So when you flash it to your car and it magically has this negative 24 number, I'm gonna instantly tell you that you have a boost leak and you need to find it because I know that with that intake, what it should put out with the similar mods that you have. So you kind of have to trust your tuner. We're not beating around the bush. We're not trying to make up excuses. And I know it gets kind of annoying because you could fix an air leak, everything be fine, and then the next map, it does the same shit. It, it gets really annoying, obviously. I know I used to work on cars. Um, it becomes a struggle, especially if you don't have like a smoke test kit. So you kind of have to look at, there's so many different things. So like for the Cobb SF intake, a lot of people mess up on this part, but if you don't put the filter on the actual pipe exactly one inch, you will get numbers like that. Um, the charge pipe to intercooler coupling, the charge pipe to turbo gasket, the TGV gaskets, or it's not tightened down fully, the intake to turbo, anything to do with that system, the gasket, anything like that could cause it. Uh, the EVCS hose is damaged. If it's like one of the hoses that go to the intake, that can cause it, or the turbo. Um, front mount or intercooler piping. I remember on like the older WRXs and STIs, for the top mount, you have that like little Y connector. 
some people would mess that up and it would have an air leak. Um, the intake manifold not being properly installed, evap lines, and then you can also see positive numbers, which sometimes could be an exhaust leak. And most of the time it's near the front O2 sensor and it's allowing unmetered air to come in and it, the car might be trying to add a lot of more a lot more fuel. Um let's see next thing that we could probably talk about is routing the EBCS. Um most of the EBCS routings are pretty straightforward for most cars. Um most have three ports. Port one normally goes to the intake, or you leave that open. Port two goes to the wastegate, and port three will go to the turbo. If you have an external wastegate, like on the FA20, um, it's going to look a little crazy because on the FA20 you have two wastegates, and on the actual wastegate you're not going to use the top port most of the time on a basic setup. Uh, you're going to pretty much port one is still going to go to the intake, but port two is going to go to a T. So you have one hose from the bottom of the wastegate of the external wastegate, one hose, um, pretty much going from the EBCS port two for the wastegate going to a T and that T is going to split off into two hoses into the bottom port of the wastegate. Not the top, the bottom. And port three will obviously go to the turbo. On a STI or older WRX, you're just going to have port two go directly to the bottom of the wastegate most of the time if you're running minimum power. Uh, on the wastegate springs, normally on a older WRX or STI, you're going to want to run what you're going, um, the base pressure that you want. So most, most STI setups, if you're doing like a basic stage one, stage two, you're gonna do 14 PSI springs. Uh, obviously if you're going with a bigger build, if you're gonna run 30, 40 PSI, um, or 27 whatever the case you can go up to like a 20 psi spring or more it just depends on what you want as base pressure uh, on an fa20 it doesn't quite work like that so on fa20 you're going to have if you put a 14 psi spring in it's most likely not going to give you 14 psi so you need to put in like 11 or 12 into each wastegate, 11 or 12, in order to get around 14 PSI um, at 0% wastegate duty, most of the time. It can always be off, but normally that's what I tend to see. Um, okay, so. I see a lot of people say um, on their base map, they're running low boost. Yes, it's the smart thing that a tuner can do. When a customer buys a tune, obviously we don't know what's gonna go on with the car for the first time. So we are going to hold back the power. Most of the time we are going to zero out the wastegate duty table, set boost limits lower that way it runs on wastegate pressure because sometimes people install the lines wrong and it starts running all the boost. So you have a second protection as a boost limit there to prevent that. Um, so most of the time when I send out base maps, the car will normally run at wastegate pressure, 14, 15 PSI. Um, that's majority, that's just me being safe for the customer. Uh, if you're having any issues and you're tuned by me, just like any other tuner, if you're having an issue, you can't sit there and 
send a picture of the access port. That absolutely does not help us at all. It's pointless and it's a waste of time. You need to log the car and try to log the car at the very point that you see the issue. That way you can catch the issue in the log and you can send that to the tuner and they don't have they can actually see it happening. If you send a picture, you're just kind of wasting time because that tuner is most likely going to tell you send the log because a picture is not going to do anything. And I swear I have so many messages of just pictures, 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 pictures. It doesn't tell me anything at all. It doesn't help. And I'm all I'm going to do is reply to you and just tell you send me a log. It's that simple. Um, let's see. So limits on the stock block on an FA20. So a FA20 most of the time you want to keep torque under 400. Um, 350 to 370 seems to be the safe route to take. Um, I've had cars that more than that not blow up or anything happen. Obviously with a bigger turbo, you can run a little bit more torque because it comes in later in the RPM uh, compared to the stock turbo that comes in pretty hot at 3200 RPM. But the safe amount, it's not the power that kills the motors, it's the torque. So if you can keep the torque around 350 to 370, most likely the car is going to last. Obviously, if you're pushing the limits going past that, you're rolling the dice every time. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's just a win. And some, and some people understand that from the get-go. Uh, the actual limits of the car and like stock form, you can get up to about 430 realistically. Yes, you can get up to 450, but it's really um, tuning things that probably should not be touched. You're messing with stuff that probably shouldn't be touched um, after that you're going to probably need port injection and obviously a bigger turbo and things like that. Um, on the stock turbo, you can get you can get to 400 on the stock turbo, but you're really pushing a lot of heat if you don't have all the necessary things for the car. Ah, uh, the the fuel limits of the block, um, and I'm mainly talking about FA20 because most of my customers are FA20 guys. The, the fueling system itself, there's a lot of controversy of how much it can actually handle and things like that. I will say based on my experience, and anybody else can have something else to say, I don't care. Just based on my experience, normally around 430 to 500, depending on if you're touching certain tables that probably shouldn't be adjusted. That's where your limit is going to be. Obviously, if you are using meth as fuel, you have a little bit more leeway and can make past that. Or if you have the Nostrum fuel pump and or injectors, you're probably gonna go be able to go up to that 500 to 550 mark. I think if I recall correctly, Nostrum pump only is right around five, maybe a little bit more, I could be wrong. I think with the injectors, you can go a little bit past that. Um, normally on the cars, when you're reviewing the data logs, on the FA20, once you get to around with a stock high pressure fuel pump, once you're around 42, 43% injector duty cycle, you'll start getting misfires. So obviously if you have meth 
or something like that, you can remove a, a lot of fuel and have a little bit more leeway on that. Um, that's pretty much for the inject like injector like stock fueling limits. Um, if you want to go past that, you need a port injection kit, which most likely leads to you having Motec in the car. So it gets it's pretty much the only way to do it properly. Um, I think a lot of people ask about the stock pump. I've had people run on full E85 and E60 and E30 on the stock fuel pump and not have issues. Now, if we're talking about the high pressure fuel pump, it's the luck of the draw at that point. It's a roll of the dice. I've had some cars on E60 with a stock fuel pump uh, if they run it too much, or even the first time, um, as everybody knows, ethanol doesn't have a lubricating substance in it compared to gasoline. So it dries up the fuel pump. And the, I'll say piston inside of the high pressure fuel pump starts to kind of seize up a little bit and you'll start having fuel pressure drops. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. So sometimes you need to run at least one tank of E80, or if you run one tank of E60 or E85, the most of the time, the next tank, you need to run pump gas. It's just the way you can re-lube the pump. Obviously with E30, um, you, most of the time you won't have that issue, but E60 and higher, it's more chance of the issue happening. Um, so how much can the ethanol handle on the stock high pressure fuel pump? You can do, like I said, you can do E85. Most will, most tuners will just do E60 because the power gains from E60 to E85 is not relevant enough. Um, I get it, it gets kind of annoying having to mix, but it's the safer and logical method to use. Ah, uh, oh, this is for the STIs. I don't know, oh, I did make one for the FA20. So, on the FA20, if you're a completely stock car, just to close out this video, we'll do the estimates. If you're a completely stock car um, with a ProTune slash E-Tune, whatever the case is, your car's probably going to make, and this also depends on fuel, um, so I'll give you the range. Uh, stage one car is probably going to make, with, with no mods, 250 to 260, maybe high 60s. Um, I'll, actually, I would say like low 260. With an intake, you most of the time will get into that 60 um 260 area and that's on pump gas if you have a completely stock car but you do e30 you're probably going to be right around 290 mm, sometimes three um now if you add an intake which is stage one plus to an fa20 you probably get around on pump gas uh, 260, 270-ish, right around there. And then on E30, you'll be at 300, 310-ish. Um, actually, I think it's going to be between 300 and 330. 
most of the time, depending on the dyno that you go on to or virtual dyno, it's it's right in that area. Um, it just all depends on the fuel, the parts, the tune, everything like that. Um, if you are a stage two car on pump gas, you're going to range from 280 to 310-ish. 310-ish being kind of if the car is working very, very well. Um, if you're on like E30, you're obviously going to be right around 350, 340-ish, right around that area. Um, if you're a stage two plus car with the intake and exhaust, um, with a front mount, whatever the case is. On pump gas, 310-ish to 320-ish, and then on E60, which most of those guys do, you'll Depending on if you have external wastegates or headers or things like that, you're going to be looking at around 350 to 400. The more parts you have on the car, the more power you're probably going to make. But the baseline is going to be around like 350, 360, one of those two. So I hope that this video answered a lot of e-tuning questions, but also some of the limits of the FA20 and common questions with the FA20. I will try to make a video more based on EJs. I just tune a lot more FA20s, but a lot of the stuff can relate to the other channels. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I will be back making more content for you guys soon. Peace out.